more time for my own projects. I'm going at the good dinosaur. Good. You know you can't technically like be up to win, right? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. I didn't want to. I, I was like, this is gonna be really dark. Part, um, you can't win because you're on the board. <laughs> no, but I don't want to like orchestrate all the parts out. Like, gotcha. Have have that, but I still want to compose it so I can add it to my. Yeah. Like, yeah, you so don't have to. Or, if oh, I look thinking rough. that I'm competing. It's gonna get me to do it. <laughs> yeah, no problem. So. Honestly, if kids want to get all worked up about like trying to like select each other's like, what a waste of time. Because yeah. they're not even going to get the final say. So even if they make it into the top five, we're still going to make a discretionary comment. Like if some really bad one gets the top five, we're like, they won't need to know that they didn't get enough votes. Can Just saying. You guys get yeah, because you're not, you're not, you're not in the, you're not in the running. <laughs> yeah, but I still want feedback. <laughs> yeah, of course you'll get feedback. Of course you'll get feedback. Let me know if you want any. Like in the next couple of weeks, I'll be a little bit more free if you want to like talk about it. Kenny, where are you? Are you dead? Are you all right? Do you have the Rona? I shouldn't joke about that. Honestly, I had a friend that had an actual, like, no symptoms COVID, and I was like, freaking lucky. They got to sit with no symptoms with a positive COVID test in their house, and everything was excused. That's why I said it's excused, but I also feel like it's like they just have to sit. Oh my God, I'd get to Hello. Hey, how's it going? Eh, it's okay. Are you all right? I'm okay, it's just I I don't usually get headaches, mm. and it's very much throwing off my focus. You're taking in the group Advil. <laughs> I also don't take Advil. Everyone else takes a lot of Advil, and I just don't. I take Advil like Skittles. Just kidding. I've been better about it. I used to take a lot of Advil when I had my metal hip, and then it got better. Okay. Let's talk. So the first thing that I want to bring up is our schedule. I am officially overriding and deciding that we are not having a meeting on that Friday before Christmas break because from past experiences, literally no one comes. And I'm gonna be leaving that day. Like, honestly, I'm going home. I'm not gonna sit here and make you guys like make your going home plans around the FSN meeting. That is just cruel. So we are gonna second to last week, make it super fun, whatever we have planned. We're just gonna, I think we have Martin Phipps actually that day. If I wanted to, I could also, I'll be here. I just don't want to. Oh, why not? Or like till like the day of, oh. because my work schedule got denied. If you want to hold a, a powwow, you are welcome to do so. Not a lot of people come. So having like an organized, like for example, it's cheaper for me to fly home Thursday. So I'm going to yeah, go fly home there. Thursday. I was just saying I'll be here. But if you want, if that's something you want to do. I don't know. It is that Friday. So I feel like people will also want to just have it. People will either be gone or like done with their finals. We're celebrating with a friend. Yeah. Or partying. Yeah. So something FSN I've never FSN done. <laughs> FSN mixer. Title it. Um, Nothing. Land. So yeah, that I wanted to say like, that's a pretty rough yeah mid finals week people are literally dead and film scoring is actually not that bad i think for our, our like can i semester because all of our recordings and stuff are done so we're just submitting like mixes which is easy because i don't mix it all as much as probably some people do i like my mock-ups sometimes i go hard unnecessarily yeah see for me but it depends it depends on what's going on if i can go that hard i feel like you go harder than I do with like the mock-up yeah. and then I go hard with like the mix. I do go hard with the mock-up. I really enjoy me. I have a hard time playing it over and over again if things sound bad, but I didn't even get to finish checking. So Alexis is doing okay. Alexis is at a pretty decent level of homeostasis that she has been maintaining. Congrats. Franco, what's up? Uh, diabetes kicked my butt this week. Uh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, levels just for some reason changed a bit. That, so balancing oh. diabetes, uh, work schedule, What's your job? Uh, so I'm an ESL tutor and a piano mm -hmm. concert. Mm -hmm. So every day, from, like I just get home at 9.30 or 9. Mm -hmm. So I barely need time to do homework. Stuck in a game jam because I wanted to. Um, Those are brutal. Yeah. And this weekend. I want to do a game jam, but I, I don't think I should. Yeah, there's two coming up. But yeah, also this Saturday, I made some plans to watch Dune and The Last Duel back to back. The last duel, Matt Damon. Did you hear that Alec Baldwin killed somebody? Yeah. But it was an accident. I know. It was like a, a I prop mean, gun. So crazy. Really yeah. sad. Yeah. I'd be traumatized. So you have a lot going on. 
Not as much as Alec Baldwin. Not as much as Alec Baldwin, but you're doing okay. You feeling better? Are yeah. You, are you getting mm -hmm. healthy? What's up? Uh, yeah, I'm. I don't know. This past these past weeks have definitely been a struggle. I just uh, I don't know. I've had a really really low energy. I had to miss some classes, so I'm hoping I can like make that up. But I'm really trying to also like not fall behind with like ethics and stuff. It's just taking me like more more uh more out of me than normal but i mean like yeah I'll, I'll try and try and keep her going about it cool well one thing i will say is that i know that everybody's students i know everybody goes through things so i do want to, especially in these times make sure that everyone's being really open about what they can and can't do so if i'm like asking for things that need to be done you know and i need to redirect maybe the workflow or something like that it is helpful if people, whether that's in the chat or just like a text to me, hey, Lauren, I'm like having a really rough week this week. I can only do blank. Oh, Great. oh, also, I was going to mention um, if you guys need like me or Lauren to send out the email for the week, yeah. we can totally do that for you guys because like I feel like it takes a lot more out of you guys to like do it, then make a draft and then run it by everyone. And like, I'm the kind of person that I'll just shoot out the email. I'll just, I'll We're not just get be it. doing that. Um, that's not how we do things, Kenny. Um, well, it's just like, if it needs to get done, if it's like Wednesday or Thursday. Yes, I agree. Yeah. One time I did that and I made a horrific typo and it was just too late. <laughs> well, I'll, st I'll still like send a draft out. I just, I feel like it takes more energy out of Franco and Michael to do that than it would me. I mean, for this week, it only took me like, 30 minutes and I just yeah. it up for class. And for next week, since it's a meeting that like we're gonna be leaving, I don't mind writing it. You don't mind? Okay, yeah, it is your, so that was gonna follow up with my next point is mm -hmm. the next topic I wanted to bring up was initiative. Let's talk about it. So, you know, Kenny and I aren't gonna be here next year. We're gonna be way graduated, which is exciting um, for you guys too, because you guys are gonna need to all get together and decide your goals and things you want to accomplish and some ideas you'll have for the board and you'll be in leadership positions and you'll have all the kids looking at you and that's really cool. And Kenny and I are in the process of just kind of like figuring out what the next steps are with that. Um, which is why we put in like the intent, which is why I wanted like at least a letter, like a statement of intent to kind of just see like where you guys are at with your commitment that you would like to have and kind of like what you are hoping to have like how what kind of involvement you're hoping to have in next semester and the semester like next fall so that's why i just want to see that before we kind of start to break all that down but a couple of things that i feel that you know i i think that um in terms of like like email sending forever you don't need kenny and i's permission to send those like just if you feel like you need one of your like if one of you wants to just be like, yep, looks good. Or if one of you can't and you just need Kenny and I to do it, that's fine. But yeah, yeah, um, just, you know, you don't need to wait for Kenny and I to always necessarily check everything off. You guys are totally welcome to like make some more initiatives and stuff with that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I still do need feedback, however, for the um, for the email yes. I made about the um, the the Reese, the good dinosaur, just because I, I will do that. I think there's, um, I think, I don't think I have everything for the necessary for, cool. um, I, I can't think of the words, but was but, that not sent out? No, because I, I, I thought I, I, I mm, <clears throat> maybe I, I forgot to do this, but I thought I cleared, I made like some text or blurb on the group chat that was like, yeah, that's good to go. Yeah. I'm sorry if I didn't. I had that all the, all mm. the stuff down for the, the part where it's like okay. here's what you need to turn in and I, I think I well let's to just that. do that tonight i will look it over i will double check that i will put it in my calendar of things to do asap and i'm fired i'm sorry and then last week i think that's what we we went to the school with me and frank we were talking about the kenny some ideas for potentially like 2022 and the spring like what people might want to see yeah like the meetings like written yeah some down and stuff like that Cool. Let's do that in one second. The next thing I want to, because this will follow, that will definitely segue into the next thing I want to talk about. The next thing I would love to talk about would be, I don't need to hear anything about like what kind of positions you guys want, but like, do you guys, I would love to just go around really quick and have everybody so that everybody's in communication with each other, talk about um, 
kind of their realistic involvement that they feel like they can have next semester and that they feel like you can have next year. So if you want to start with Franco, some thoughts on that. Um, for next semester, I definitely will have probably a lot more time for involvement because I'll have, mm -hmm. as of right now, I'm still talking with Jimmy to see what I can do to us. Because I'm trying to double major with soul scarring and big in scoring. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to see how I can get ahead of that next semester. But cool. as it stands, I just have 12 credits. Mm -hmm. So it could probably be part-time if nothing changes, which means I'll have a lot more time to just do more stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely like the same or more time commitment I have right now for next semester. And for next year, I'll still be busy with stuff, but I would move my like a more like leadership position with that too. Cool. What about you, Michael? Um, honestly, like I, I don't have like, um, specific, like just like, I don't have like a set in stone plan for like what mm -hmm. my future is going to be just like here and stuff. So, I mean, I, it's so hard for me to answer that right now. Oh, at Berkeley? I, yeah. Um, gotcha. but I, I can definitely give a better answer when I have the opportunity to think about that more and stuff. But okay. I, I, no, I just, I don't know. Things are just uncertain right now. I'm just not sure. About your return to Berkeley in the fall? I, possibly. Okay. Um, just not sure as of now. I, okay. I wish I would, if I had a concrete answer, I would definitely give it. That's I, fine. I just, what about know. next semester? Do you know if you'll be here next semester? Um, not sure. I, it's kind of the, the same thing, unfortunately. I'm not okay. sure. Okay. All right. Yeah. But, well, I, but if I am, obviously, I, I want to be like, I, I definitely like I, I love to be contributing to this, to this, this club. I really, really do. Yeah, so I obviously really hope I can. Well, I will say yeah. a couple things to that. Um, that's totally cool. Yeah. Everybody goes through things. Everybody it, it, at the end of the day, it's a student club. Right. So if it's like really negatively affecting your mental health or if there's things that you're having it's a hard not time with balancing. The club is not affecting you at all. Cool. Like OK, but OK, sounds good. So just I'll say I'll be I'll say whatever the word is, stay in touch or like keep yeah. in touch. Yeah. I'll Sounds good. Be communicative. Okay. Um, for next semester, yeah. I was thinking I can do. Oh, you're going to be in Spain. Yeah. So I think I could take over the emails from them. Okay. And do maybe emails and social media because that can all be done asynchronously to you guys mm -hmm. in terms of timing. So like the time zone will be an issue in mm -hmm. terms of getting stuff sent out. I'll have a lot more time over there as well because I can't work. So it'll be the first time I've never had a job and been yeah. in school. Cool. Um, I could probably zoom into all the meetings. If you, if you want it'll to. it'll be like 7 p.m. on a Friday. Yeah. I shouldn't have class. So I'm willing to be like as involved and just take over all the stuff that can't be done physically here to like yeah. take the stress off of you guys and stay as involved. Yeah. Here's so the thing. Like, I haven't signed up for Spain like so long. Yeah, ago. which is exciting. And that's not going like, to make your October role any. Don't worry about freshman. it. Freshman. First yeah, semester, no. so I haven't really planned for this. That's totally okay. And being in this book, I didn't even know about it. Yeah. But I'd like <laughs> to stay involved and take over the stuff. Because I do like doing the social media. Yeah. I did want to say one thing. I think if we made a better schedule for sending out the emails, like mm -hmm. by the weekend, we had to, by Monday, we had to draft them. Mm -hmm. By Tuesday, it was sent out. So that way I could make the post on Wednesday okay. and post about it again on Thursday. Because I feel like I've been making very last minute posts. Good. Okay. Based off the email, and sometimes like people might miss it, so I'd like to make the Instagram post at least by Wednesday, mm -hmm. and then do like a interactive story on Thursday. Awesome. For Friday. All right. Can we agree Friday. to do an email on drafts? Draft yeah. on the weekend, I'm out on Monday. The yeah. For next week, so awesome. We'll probably get it done by this weekend. Cool. Additionally, in the meetings, mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to be more active in the meetings in terms of like taking pictures and all. I just feel like sometimes it's like a privacy thing for the yeah. people on Zoom. Yeah. And the people. And in the, the people meeting. in here. Like a couple things, like I grab quick pictures, but when I'm like sitting, like that's. We typically, yeah, but that's not usually like. A so huge I just thing. wanted to make sure that that wasn't something that yeah. I just wanted. Yeah. Another thing. Um, so then there's two other things. And Kenny, you're welcome to cut in anytime. I'm, there's a couple things I wanted then next kind of move into. And the first thing is. I know Kenny and I are kind of like the club leaders ATM, you know, like when people are going to come into the room and they have questions and stuff, they kind of seem to come to everybody. But what I would really love to see more of is, is just like whole club engagement. So I would love to see you guys like 
mingling, meeting people. What's your name again? Oh, cool, cool, cool. Like I would love to get to a point where I feel like we know our members better. Cause the problem is, is we have a lot of members, which is not a problem. It's a good, it's a good problem to have. We've doubled our capacity since my freshman year. It's my fourth year, we've doubled our capacity, which is awesome. We used to maybe fill up half, a third to half this room, which is now we're packed. So that's awesome. But I do feel like, and I include myself in this as well, want to be more engaging with members, especially in like that 10 minute period before, you know, like that might seem like a really small window where everybody just kind of chills, but I think it would be a good opportunity to like meet people, be a little bit more like, hey, and just engaging because, you know, these are going to be people that are going to be here next year. So also, yeah. I found actually that just being engaging with film scoring students in general is also great because they often to once you hang out with like film scoring students more which you'll find as you get more into the program uh, like all the film scoring students are like in their own little groups and the more you talk with them the more they'll actually like show up at fsn meetings because then they feel like it's like a little family instead of a club that you just kind of have to go to and there's a reason a lot of the seniors don't come part of that's because some of the information like the rescores and stuff is a little bit irrelevant to their like level of working and then some of that's because a lot of them don't have great experiences from early fsn so you guys yeah. are going to be leading up um this like new chapter of people that weren't a part of the previous leadership that have really negative experiences with that so our class was like the last graduating class that really spent a lot of time with the previous leadership that caused interdepartmental and outer club problems. Yeah, so this is a great opportunity to start thinking about kind of like the culture that we want to, you know, foster. Personally, Kenny and I know, I know what we've been working really hard on trying to bridge this gap of like competition and kind of this general bit of sometimes friction and unfriendliness that can happen with some of the film scoring students for no reason. Mm -hmm. um, just, just like that, because we're in a competitive small major where everybody wants to prove themselves and be the best and get jobs and, you know, and with creative things like that comes people being really insecure and X, Y, and Z. And we really don't want to keep that up. And we've done a really good job about not keeping that up. It used to be a huge problem. So I feel like, you know, communication, talking with our members, you know, we should look into some type of like social mixer at some point. I was gonna say maybe to have like just the meetings specifically, just like snacks, food, drinks, stuff like that. People can just talk, hang out, and have yeah. like something playing in the background. We I could even like have meetings that aren't on Fridays. Like yeah. we can have e like we could have like a Saturday mixer or something mm -hmm. on campus or at a separate like house or location. That's an option. And so I think we should do some brainstorming for that as yeah, well. Yeah, for those, I'm not sure, but the club department fill out a form of like who's going there and for contact tracing. That's what the video game scoring club oh. is doing for a Halloween event. Oh, so interesting. Well, we should look into that. Yeah. It's a Sunday. Sure. It is a Sunday. Yeah. It might be a bit last minute, but people might already have plans. Yeah, yeah everybody's sure probably going to be doing their thing. We can talk about it. That's yeah. for, that's a that's an option. Mm -hmm. I won't Something. be available till like till they're but like nighttime. Yeah, I like don't go out on Halloween. It is scary, and people in the city do crazy things. Oh, um, my friends wanted to go to Salem on a Halloween, and I was like, "That is asking for trouble." My friend got jumped by clowns in a van outside my apartment when he left my apartment on Halloween. Um, um, so I yeah, don't leave my apartment. <laughs> yeah he had to mace people so back on track the other thing i really want to talk about before like christian or someone comes in the last thing i want to talk about um would definitely be um what am i looking for board applications this is a big one so something to consider and alexis not being here in person it's going to be franco kenny and i and michael potentially um how many members do you guys see yourself having, you know, like if, if we were going to step back and it was just the three of you right now, how many more people would you want to bring onto the board? Okay. We've had, we've had up to seven before. Yes. A little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I think bringing on someone before the fall, whether it be the summer or the spring would be a good idea. Whether it was just like what I did over the summer, like smaller yeah. stuff, just to like introduce them before just like, because I liked being introduced like a little yeah. bit before coming into this. 
the goal is to establish what roles we kind of have planned for you guys next semester, like early next semester, and put out board applications this December. And for the spring semester, kind of have sh like shadowing mm -hmm. light participants that are going to be on the board for next fall that are going to be like active members. I'm going to feel like four or five people. To bring four or five no, people? Like total. Oh, oh, oh. 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 <laughs> Along six, so right now we're five. And I think with one more to bridge the gap and make some things easier so that nobody has to carry too much weight. I just don't want too many opinions. Like really what kind of jobs do you think are not being distributed correctly right or now? Not necessarily, uh, not distributed correctly per mm -hmm. se, uh, but maybe uh, with more people, there could be maybe more planning, stuff mm -hmm. like that, because for example, we're all really busy right now. But mm -hmm. if there was like one person designated for like these social outside of club meeting events, People, your votes for three more people. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? I think I, I personally vibe with like the five total. I do think that's just a really solid number. I like the um the um the um I can't I, I can't think of words today, but just like the collective just um vibe, I guess. Um I I, I, don't, I don't, that seems like a good number to me. I think the odd number to it is to be like if it were come down if we really had to like vote on something like this. Oh, <laughs> there needs to be like, a vote out. Not like a vote, but if there's like three people have this idea, three people have this idea, that gets hard to say. Well, how about this? How about we bring two people in this next semester? Mm -hmm. And if you are feeling like with Kenny and I really stepping back, like it's not getting done, or you leave, or something happens, we can bring a third in halfway through the yeah, spring. That's awesome. So we're, like gonna, yeah, are you cool with that, Kenny? Yeah. We, oh yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I don't know that you're no, you're good. For us, for like the fall, I think we talked about it. I know I'll be in Boston over the summer. I believe you will mm -hmm. too, potentially. And I have no idea. Maybe, but like meeting over the summer, like once a week, whether it's for like coffee or something, and yeah. plan out the semester ahead. I know the summer was hard because everyone was all over the place. Yeah. But even like continuing the weekly meetings, whether maybe once every two weeks was in person. I think we could plan it out in advance because I already have some ideas, but like having a set stone beforehand, I feel like we'll just make the semester yeah. so much more fluent yeah. and easier. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, as I know our schedule got filled up really quickly, which is really great. Um, but next semester, I would love to see you guys put more schedules, mm -hmm. things on the schedule. So if you want, if you feel like you need an extra meeting to talk that out, just be more verbal about that. Like if you're like, I don't want to wait till Friday or I don't feel like we're going to have time to do it on Friday. Is anyone free to meet Wednesday? More than likely, probably either Kenny or I or someone, you know, can be ready to meet. We can have a meeting, whether you and Alexis could meet something, you know, be like, hey, I'd love to meet. Yeah, unless it's Christian. Christian, is that you? Hey, come on in. Hello. That's awesome. Um, he's here to do, and I didn't know he had a tattoo. Yeah. That's so cool. Oh, he has a tattoo. Christian has a tattoo. Huh. Kenny has oh, um, a fever, awesome. so Kenny's not here today. Oh, I see. I'm okay. I'm, I'm okay. Cool. Cool. Like he's been working on the tech assistant for all, all the stuff and the different aspects of either the Lion King and all that, but the tech assistant. Mm -hmm. It was something that I was interested in to ask him for, like maybe a Zoom meeting or something yeah. for next semester. Cool. And learn about other routes after school besides being a closer. So next semester, you guys have the freedom because this was kind of like a like this was your guys' first time really working with us. You guys have the freedom to go. Hey, on this day, I have blank planned. Next semester, go for it. You don't need to go. What about this? This day, I would like to do blank. Cool. Put it on the schedule. Like you are free to write, put things down on the calendar. Yeah, I think it'll be better. I think maybe some of us were like didn't want to stress in too much. Um, Sure. Same experience as you guys. So like, I mean, I'm on year four. I'm I'm tapping. Like you guys are welcome to start taking over the schedule. And Kenny, you're welcome to still do the schedule. Whatever. But I just 
think that it, I would be really doing a really poor favor to everybody if I was putting mm -hmm. a lot of effort in next semester's calendar and putting a lot of things on again, like I did this semester. And then come next semester, you guys realize how much effort it is to fill yeah. up a schedule. Because <laughs> it's really hard to fill up a schedule every week. It, it's hard. I could like um, some of the ideas to you later. Yeah. I think we need to get the screen ready to go um, so that we know how to get this done and then we can keep talking. So Kenny. <laughs> That's all I learned in Spain. How do I how do I zoom? Christian, I do you want to work from your laptop or I brought mine, but I didn't know how it works. Okay, yeah, come bring your laptop in. And then I'm gonna have you do you have the Berkeley FSN Zoom? I have a link about the information to log in. Like oh yeah um i'm gonna make you're gonna log in and i'm gonna make you the host oh, okay. you're gonna sign you're gonna just join and i'm okay. gonna make you the host and then we're gonna get your laptop hooked up and then i will be the participant to double check that we don't get like a weird phase thing or whatever happens yep because i know kenny knows how to fix that and you guys need to fit listen up because i'm like what if i what if i don't know how to do it you guys have to know next semester too i know how to get the sound Yes, we learned that last time. Remember, I was like, sandwich for um, what's up? Uh, so I'm eventually gonna yep, put yep. my laptop here. Yes. And all I need is we're gonna give you this and the HDMI. Okay. And I think it's that like should be enough. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, I was Tate was really crowded and there was this guy sitting like literally right here, and my laptop was here, so they put my sandwich right here, and I like ate my sandwich like so close to this guy. And it was like messy and it was like falling apart, and it was just a really uncomfortable. Moment. Right under yeah. I feel like that always looks chaotic every time. It gives me anxiety because there's all these Berkeley kids. That's why like half in a row I stand there. Really? But it's always packed. But I know my order. I've went there way too much. Oh, like, it's really good to know that you like Cafe Nero. It's very nice. Um, and they play like little jazz music. And mm. it's not it's as loud. It's never as loud in there. Like it's loud if it's there's like a line. But once the line dies out, like everyone's like working, mm -hmm. which is nice. So it's good to sit. Yeah, your hair looks really good today. Huh? Your hair looks really good. You didn't realize it was that long. Yeah, it is very long. I get a haircut like once a year because I'm impatient. I don't like sitting there. Yeah, I feel that. And to dye it, that just takes so long. This is not my natural. It probably starts down here now, the highlights. Like they're now, but... Yeah, I get highlights, but not very often. I'm going back to full brown because I don't like keeping them up. Oh, like brown. dark brown? Like, whatever this is, but darker. This is my original color. It's a pretty mousy, unimpressive color, but it's... So it works if I want to go darker. Oh my gosh. So basically, Lauren, for the little, since I wanted to have like a speaker camera and then like on another computer, just have like the audience on Zoom. Yeah. Whatever. Okay, with being an audience cam laptop. Yeah, it could be. Thank you. Whatever laptop is showing the audience, it needs to have its audio output muted yeah and it's microphone muted okay you can actually do both of those in zoom the audio output has to be muted for franco's or uh, yeah so since it there's like a little when you pull up video and audio uh, franco knows how to do this i think we did this last week yeah okay but you can right. just take the output and just scroll it back all the way i'm going to make you the host you You've been hosted. Questions. Oh, can you make me a co-host? Yeah. So that I can, um, Kenny, are you going to stay at the meeting? I shall, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, then can you make Kenny a co-host so that he can let people in? Are you cool with that, Kenny? Yeah, I was going to say that since I'm here, I can be like just fully focused on the Zoom, Zoom, the Zoom people. We should ask Grace. Grace Mary's here every week, so we should just ask her to help do that. That too. I miss I her. I love that she just that. comes still. Seriously. All right. And you are in the seat of power. Do, 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 do. So, uh, mm -hmm. you all know the, was that like Lord of the Rings movie? That was Lord of the Rings. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, it's a questionnaire that I made a bit ago. Like, what semester are you in?
Oh, can you hear me? Hey, hey Andy. Andy. Hey, how's it going, y'all? Hello. Hey, how are you, Andy? Good, how are you? Is your uh, setup a little different today? Oh, I'm just in a, at a different angle. I think I was from here before. Me. <laughs> oh, shoot. I'm so sorry. What so thank you so much for coming. Of course. It's good to see you. I know it's like, what, 10 a.m. where you are? Yeah. So c c composer early, but normal not so early. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, I'm going to go on your website and just read some of the credits off. That's OK. Oh, boy. Yeah, sure. Go <laughs> Oh, oh yeah. Sorry. I'm All good. Going on. This is just light. I don't know. I just pushed. What the timing? I know. Seriously. It's awesome. all right. <laughs> no pressure. Um. Did your output change? Did your yeah. Is there? Oh, you're still on lava uh, on the volume. Hmm. <clears throat> yeah. So while we're in this state of limbo, I do just want to say I did just send out an email with a questionnaire for FSN, uh, just to know where you guys are at and what we can do next semester to just like accommodate activities to what your needs are. So it just should take two minutes. So we really appreciate it. It's just through the FSN email. You don't want to do that. I don't want to, I'm probably... Oh, that's super pro. <laughs> we never had questionnaires. You guys have stepped it up. Turning <laughs> things like in the chat. Let me see. Um. Oh, no, he did. I'm going to try to unplug. Hmm? I'm going to try that. Yeah, just try unplugging it. The thing, the screen projector is on. They have all the input set at the same setting that they were just working on. I'm asking if you have a solution. There we go. Okay. Andy, can you say something? Hey. Hey. Okay. okay. All right. Cool. All right. So, everyone, Andy is an ex Berkeley student, a previous FSN president, and he has since forged a career in LA as a film and TV composer. You might hear some of his work on Magic of Disney's Animal Kingdom on Disney Plus, uh, The Last Alaskans on Discovery Channel. He's done a lot of stuff on Lifetime and Netflix as well. Um, we're lucky to have him. It's Andy Forsberg. Let's give it up. member Christian if you want to introduce yourself like he's in the yeah he's so a senior. I'm in no way associated with the board I just really wanted to bring Andy in we had such a well at least from my point of point of view uh, I interviewed him once in the past it was actually for an assignment um, this time is totally totally elective that I'm bringing him here but I just really wanted to uh, share what I think and know he might have to say today so thank you for coming cool yeah, thank you all for having me. It's nice to see 268 again. And <laughs> yeah, oh, do you man. recognize it? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah. Uh, can you? Is it possible to shift me around really quick, or is everyone online? No, there's people in the room, right? Too. Yes. No, no on the cool. Yeah, you're you're on the oh, projector behind me. Oh, hang on. Man. Let me switch to. Oh, hey, look at that <laughs> Zoom. You think after two and a half years I have this figured out? But no, there we go. Hey, how's everyone doing? <laughs> Good cool. to see you. Thanks for coming. Yeah, of course. Thank you all. All right. Um, let's just start very slowly. Um, I'm going to try to render a little roadmap of how you got to where you are now. Not spend sure. too much time before Berkeley, but definitely very curious about first steps and then how you've kind of cemented yourself over the years. Um, sure. So where did you grow up? Um, I grew up in Colorado. So I was there until I came to Boston, um, which was nice. Grew up in the mountains in a tiny little 800 person town. So, but my dad's from Boston. So I had been out there before and kind of already knew the scene. So, yeah. Nice. Um, is there any specific way you remember you heard about Berkeley or were kind of drawn to Berkeley or music in general? How did, how did, uh, how did you connect the dots with Berkeley and did you know you wanted to do film scoring before Berkeley? That's a, it's a good question. Um, I really loved TV and film, and I didn't know I was all right at music until I had a, a music teacher 
tell me I should consider it. Um, I actually wanted to be a geologist. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and then um, about my like sophomore year of high school, um, started doing honor orchestra stuff. I was a percussionist, um, orchestral percussionist, um, not a drummer, I wish. Um, and so, yeah, I always loved movies and TV. And then I kind of, one day in my sophomore year, when, when I was a kid, I, I played some, some sports and my mom had bought me the tape for the Mighty Duck soundtrack, which had the David Newman suite on it. And I would put the tape out in the boom box next to our pond. And I would like play hockey on the pond and score at like the, the <laughs> like the climax of the queue. And I did that as a kid and I never really realized what that kind of meant. And then as I started to go further on and like get into film scores and stuff, one day I was like, oh yeah, this is a, a job and right. I like music, but I wanna be in TV and film. And I can do this through music. And so I just typed in film scoring degree, <laughs> see if that was a thing. And at that time, I think Berkeley was the only place in the world that offered right. it as an under. So, um, yeah, but kind of boring in the fact that Berkeley was the only place I applied. But um, that's, uh, but I did like the early action thing and like that's so had some backups. But I uh, yeah, so that's how I kind of came into film scoring and, 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 and found Berkeley. Awesome. So that was around 2010. Am I correct on that? Mm -hmm. 2010, you come into Berkeley. And did you start at the very beginning? Or did you kind of like, because I know after, after the summer after your sophomore year, that's when you landed your first internship, right? Yeah. And then, um, so up until that point, had you taken any film scoring classes? Or was it all just kind of like core stuff? Um, I had bought Richard Davis's book, <laughs> the intro to film scoring book. Yeah, yeah. I think it was probably like 20 editions before where you probably are now. And uh, I just like, I just fell in love with it before I ever came there. So I got really curious about who had scored what, what film scoring meant. And, and, and cause I knew I had a pretty good idea that I wasn't really going to be starting film scoring classes for a few semesters. So I right. just wanted to be involved with it and, and know what I could before I came in. Um, but um, yeah, so I just learned as much as I could, watched tons of interviews with composers on YouTube and just learned as much as I could before I got to Berkeley and then just was doing all the core classes and then, yeah, into the normal curriculum that you got. Interesting because why do you think you got picked up for that first internship? I mean, you didn't really progress through, you know, the film scoring curriculum. So what, what do you think made you of interest to, was it Bill Ross, right? Yeah. So actually right where you're sitting right now, uh, it was like a random Thursday night. I think I was just having coffee with a friend and we we're like, oh yeah, this email we forgot about. Um, and this is just luck to some extent. Um, and it was three people, four people actually, that were ex Berkeley alums that were probably five years before me. And one of them's name was Alex Kovacs, and he was like the senior assistant at Bill Ross. Jerome Leroy, who was his business partner at the time, Sarah Kovacs, who is now Alex's wife, but also like a super power agent now at Craft Angle out here for composers. And then uh, Pat Kui, who is also an amazing composer out here. And afterwards, I just went up and she had the, there didn't end up, luckily, being that many people there. So it was very casual. I think there was five of us in the first two rows. And everyone was like, OK, let's go get beer. After, And I was like, I'm going to talk to Alex because um, I just like vibe with him and Sarah and just talked with them for a minute. And then they didn't really say anything about internships or anything. I got Alex's email. And then followed up with him probably a week later. Like your brain some power or whatever, you know, I, I didn't right. ask about an internship, right. um, which I think is actually important. I think like, you know, uh, you have to ask for what you want and, and go for it. But I think, you know, there should be some, <laughs> some <laughs> foreplay, you know, in, in getting like to, to, to know someone. And so I was just like, hey, I hope you and Sarah are doing well. They were like newlyweds, all this stuff. So we kind of had some correspondence for, I don't know, about three weeks. And he's like, hey, just want to let you know, uh, there's an internship opening up at Bill's this summer. Um, 
I've kind of let Bill know about you. We've been talking, like, would you be interested? And then I think there were like four other people that had gone for it. And um, then he just emailed me one day and was like, hey, do you want to come to LA this summer? And I was like, hell yeah. And uh, that's kind of where it began. So, Wow. So you were like, what? Um, how old were you back then? Uh, during the internship, I would have been 20. 20? Yeah. yeah cause I find 19, that, I, I 19 find that turning 20. 19, 20. Wow. So I find that really wise. <laughs> to to be to know that as a 19 20 year old just not to have i want a job written all over my face you know try to just make friends first and have that sense of calm sure i'm sure looking back on it like i was like oh i was so confident <laughs> like i'm i'm sure i still look super eager and starry eyed but i was trying to play it cool i like to think i played it cool but who knows <laughs> and, and that 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 comes into play a lot in a heightened way once you get to LA right because yeah absolutely it's it's kind of like, um, yeah. Inherently, you want to just make friends with people, but you know, you know, like imagine going to LA, you're talking to a composer. They know they have something of value that they can offer you, but you have to kind of stay cool, right, to a certain degree. And yeah. like, what what is your kind of philosophy on, you know, networking once you get there? Yeah, uh, this is my favorite question, because um, I think that, you know, when I met up with people, well, I was lucky, I, I will say I was lucky that I came out here with an assistantship. So when I was meeting with people, there was a little pressure off of like looking for a job. So I understand like when you're moving here, and you have to pay the bills out of the gate, like, um, sometimes you just have to be straight up like I'm looking for a job I need money like like help but I think like not on the first time with people for coffee or emailing people I and and I think you have to genuinely believe this is like just make yeah like you said just making friends just getting to know people because as you said like the the eagerness on the face kind of thing like they know that someone new from Berkeley or from wherever they come from um, are going to want a job or they, uh, they, you're talented. And, and the more you get to know more composers, show that you're around, let people know, you know, and, and inherently, if you don't bring it up right away and be like, hey, do you have any openings? Like, they'll ask you what you're up to. And you can be like, well, yeah, I'm looking for an assistantship, blah, blah, blah. And even if they don't have something at the time, it could just be, you know, two months down the line, like you're working your barista job or your bartending job. And you get a call from one of the composers you haven't even met with because they're one of those friends that you had developed recommended you or so it's just keeping this that job um, when I came out here I spent the first two years of LA even more really just I, I, I got some great advice from the composer Richard Gibbs um, I don't think he was a Berkeley guy maybe he was a Berkeley guy way back like I mean like in the 60s anyway he he always told me he's like never be home and um i'm also how you will but um he was like if you need to be home working all that stuff but like you know be out a couple of the first directors i worked with out here were uh one guy brought me down my first imac at the apple store at the grove and in central la and, and and things like that so just just always being out meeting people i think like front like front loading the first part of your time here with with really expanding that network is important because it's going to lead you down the road to resources you, you forget about like people you haven't been in touch with for a while they're like oh yeah andy or christian or whoever you know so anyway going on a tangent but i mean you can think about that subconsciously but at the end of the day um like one of my best friends out here and it's funny because he like I actually haven't worked with him, um, but uh, we've talked about it, but I almost don't want, sometimes I've like developed relationships with composers too, where I'm like, I almost don't want to work with you now because I don't want it to like accidentally mess up our friendship or whatever. I, uh, through a couple other composers, I, I met Gordy Hab, who scores all the Star Wars games. Um, and he's like, he's my tennis doubles partner. And we've been playing tennis together for like six, seven years. And the other day he was like, oh, do you like, what's your skill set for like maybe writing? A couple of cues on this thing and i was like 
yeah, like I'll think about, I don't know. It was just, um, it's very interesting how you develop friendships with people and what your roles, but we always call Gordy anytime. And he's like 15 years older than me. And, and uh, like, we've talked about Christian, and I know you wanted to talk about today too, like developing relationships and being in assistant ships with people that it doesn't always have to be Hans or Lauren, like they're amazing people to, to go and study under and learn from. But I think learning from people that are like 10 steps ahead of you sometimes instead of a hundred steps ahead of you, you know, the composers that are, are working composers and not the composers that are making $90 million a year, a hundred million dollars a year. I think you just see those next actionable steps. And, and Gordy is one of those people in my life that I just really trust and look up to and can ask for advice. And um, yeah. So anyway, that was a long tangent. Yeah, I'm no. sure I bl blew, blew some of your later questions, but <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking. Next three questions are just completely gone, but uh, uh, let's backtrack a little bit. Um, you were able to, you were able to lock down an assistant assistantship job before making that move to LA. You told me earlier that you you um, rented out an apartment that you hadn't even seen, so it was all kind of like <laughs> you're all in. Um, yeah. But can I get a show of hands of any like video game miners in here? Does anyone know of uh, Hexany Audio? Yes? So, Andy, you actually founded Hexany as well, is that correct? Yeah, I founded Hexany with Richard. A year before him, did two assistantships, one with Bill Ross, one with Ryan Shore. And then when Richard got out here, we took it full time and hired people. And I did that for two years with them. And then we were doing like only video game stuff. Um, and I wanted to be more in the film TV realm, love video games, but, um, but it was just, I was basically ended up just running the company and I wasn't writing any music. So I was like, this is not for me. So, uh, all peaceful, but Richard bought me out and I, I left there. Um, but yeah, co-founded Texany as well. So, yeah, nice. Just a little fun fact there. I was surprised to find that out last time. Um, <laughs> so after Bill Ross, you started working another assistantship job was with Ryan Shore. Is that correct? Yeah. So Bill, I, I don't know if I answered your question about going for to Bill's. Sorry. So yeah. So Bill, yeah, yeah. Hi, hi, so that summer uh, at Bill's as 2012, um, I just, I had a blast. I mean, it was so much fun. We were at his studio at his house, kind of like this, you know, just out back behind the house built out and, um all the assistants and him, we'd all eat lunch around the table every day and it was just such a such a good vibe and bill actually asked me to stay at the end of that summer <laughs> i wasn't like i've always loved school to be honest and like i wasn't even drinking age i was like i i want to finish at berkeley i have no idea into berkeley and i was like why the hell did i turn that to <laughs> like like not because i didn't find berkeley it's so extremely valuable and like the networks there and like charity cherish your time um but um at the end of the year basically i came back for two more semesters so i was going to be a senior and i actually hosted film scoring network meeting with uh with bill and at the end i just felt so nostalgic for seeing him and doing this and i called him because over winter break he had actually offered it to me again and i was like ah, i just want to stay and um, he was basically like, you're an idiot. You're such an idiot. And then I decided to call him. Um, and I was like, is this offer still on the table? Like, cause I was thinking about going back and interning for him that summer, but I was like, if I'm gonna go do that whole internship again. I might as well start my life out there and like do this. So I called him and he's like, he's like, yeah, let's like negotiate and like talk about the details. And then he called me. to leave and I was like yeah okay and he's like if you do decide to he's like I'll send you to London next week to score supervise at Abbey Road so he flew me to London I had never been on a major scoring stage in my life and I was running the entire 100 piece orchestra session just like having the best time but also terrified that I was going to mess it up and uh and like before good zoom or google chat I mean we kind of had skype but it was like laggy and he was listening through source connect like through the board and just sending me like frantic messages and i was like man i but i loved it i loved it so then i flew back 
I took my Berkeley finals and then I left and went to LA. So then I worked for Bill for about four or five months. Um, that's a, that's a whole other, uh, other story that, that didn't in, involve me really. Um, but ended up leaving there and, um, went to, yeah, go work for Ryan Shore, Howard Shore's nephew. So anyway, sorry. Just no, to no, no, no. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. But that, that brings up another kind of related question is that you're not going to be someone's assistant forever. And during that time, you're kind of part of this close knit team, a family, almost like you learn how, how they work and, and you mm -hmm. become an asset, but you eventually have to leave. You either mm -hmm. leave for good to freelance or you're going to Ryan Shore in this case. Like, how do you mm -hmm. leave with poise without burning bridges? How do you, Ooh. yeah. That's a great question. Um, <laughs> this is gonna sound morbid, um, but it's really hard not to. Like, people become so reliant on you that I, I think like time heals a lot of things. Right. And I think that when you leave someplace, you, the, the most graceful thing you can do is really have someone in mind to come in for them on your own uh, to find someone that you think might be a good fit to, to fill your position. Someone that's easy to train into that position. You just never want to leave anyone hanging ever. Um, from from the work side of things um, but you're right it is close-knit and it's like a family so I think they're I think what I was talking about with composers that are way ahead and you know the a-list a-list um, they don't view people as more more dispensable I think they've just seen so many people and uh, they don't get as close to them and it's kind of like but then sometimes that people are there for 10 years you know and they're so close and they're like you want to go off and do your own thing but you've been here and every situation is just just really different. Um, when I left Bill's, there was another assistant coming in for a different situation over there. And then when I left Ryan's, um, there was actually my friend Luke Imbush. Um, he does a ton of Disney scoring stuff out here. He has a really awesome band called the Rhode Island. Sorry, there's a bug. <laughs> and um, he, uh, oh my gosh, he totally lost the thread. <laughs> what was it what was your question i totally lost the thread. Uh, it was like leaving um, leaving assistant ships gracefully oh, leaving, sorry yeah. sorry sorry so yeah so then um i knew that i wanted to leave to to, to go full-time with, with hexany and actually launch that with richard and start developing it and um i had been at ryan's for about about a year and he was like pretty reliant. I mean, I mean, like in, in a in a way he should be, not that he was crushing it. Um, just you know, all the assistant things you learn and know, and like you don't tell the composer about because you just take care of it and you're like, how am I gonna take this away and not have it all fall apart and leave this person hanging? So I remember Ryan being like, I think I want to hire an intern this summer. The guy. Mm -hmm. And so Luke and I were friends at Berkeley, and we we're actually the same year, but I had left the year early. And um, I, <laughs> I called Luke and I was like, look, I think like you should come out for this internship because I was like talking him up to Ryan. And then like, Ryan doesn't know this. This is terrible. <laughs> I was like, Ryan doesn't know this, but I'm going to leave at the end of the summer and it'll be perfect because you'll be training all summer. And here's Luke. And, and it worked out and it was perfect. And there was really no hard feelings. And Luke actually stayed there for like four and a half years and crushed it. Um, so Anyway, just, yeah, just being mindful. Uh, you can't worry too much at the end of the day, you know, what other people are going to think of you, but you do have to have tact. You do have to be respectful um, and great, gracious and um, all those things that just being a good human is. And, um, and yeah, so anyway. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. At that point, were you kind of, after Shore, were you kind of ready to start your own freelance kind of thing? Um, or was well, there so that, another period? So that's now we're into the Hexany period. Okay. So throughout my entire assisting time and end of Berkeley, I was the, like starting to work with directors. There's a ton of, you know, I was working with Emerson people and, you know, and doing their thesis films and 
you know, developing relationships with budding directors and people who've gone on to be producers and music supervisors, like, um, and so I was kind of always aware that I was going to go freelance eventually and be the composer and do the thing. Um, but, um, Hexney was like really unexpected. When I interned here for Bill that summer, I actually ended up spending a lot of time with Richard. I didn't know him that well at Berkeley, but he's from California. So we ended up hanging out a bunch. Um, and then he was kind of like, I have this idea, like, do you want to be a part of it? And um, then we kind of started getting some like small work at Berkeley. And then we were like doing pretty well, like on the side, but I obviously couldn't put my full time into it. And he was finishing his double major. So as soon as he got out here, I was like, okay, Ryan, bye. And Richard and I just like did the startup thing and like just roughed it. <laughs> I mean, just like roughed it to get it started. And then it took off pretty quick. And as you all know, it's super successful now. And Richard has done an awesome job like steering that company. And, um, but I did that from, so I left Ryan's in 2004. So I was at Hexney full time running that with Richard for two, like a little over two years. Um, and we hired three people and now they have like 14 people. It's amazing. Um, and then, uh, yeah. And then I was like, okay, I, I want my autonomy. I want to do the composer thing, just me. So I've been freelance now for six years ish. Wow. So, and yeah. uh, I think it's safe to assume when you first do that freelance thing, you're not going in with the team working around you. It's just, it's just you, right? So you're yeah. Yeah. orchestrator, composer, mock-up producer, all that. Um, time so, management and organization, two key. strategies in those in those domains. Oh man, I'm sorry. This altiverb background's distracting me. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Um, okay, uh, so the. Uh, yeah, I time management has always been interesting for me. And it's actually been a struggle because I, I'm very type A, but I like procrastinate through planning sometimes. So sometimes I have to like take a step back and realize that I'm doing too much. And I actually just need to do the work and not schedule all the work all the time and be focused on that. Um, but I, um, I'm trying to think of specifics from a time management perspective, because there's obviously managing your, your personal life and how that blends in with um, managing your projects. And the times you have to be most organized are obviously when you're on the most projects. And I'm mostly in TV now, which I love, but the schedules are insane. This last Lifetime movie I did, it was 84 minutes of music in 10 and a half days, <laughs> which is uh, insane. And I did it with Luke, my music editor. He wrote cues too. And, um, but yeah, I probably did 80% of that score and it was rough, but it was TV. So then you're done and then you have a couple of weeks off and it's all good. Um, but time management, uh, do you have like a more specific question? I can totally, I just want, I just don't want to get lost in like, cause I could go and talk. I about mean, this, forever, this, right? this definitely blends in with, you know, life as well. It's like, what's important to you? You're a yeah. composer, but you're a, you know, human being first. Like what, what aren't you willing to give up? And like, do you still make time to, meet your friends and visit. Yeah. Loved ones. Okay, good. Now, now a better picture. Cool. Okay. Awesome. So, so, um, yeah, I think that, um, community and friends have always been super important for me. I think that as a film composer or any creative, I think that, um, any problems I've had with, with, um, seeing other people in assistant ships with some bigger composers, and and just uh more run-of-the-mill assistant ships is that they're always like if you're not doing this 24 hours a day you don't love it and it's just like dude like there's a reason that nurses and other people and, and i'm not comparing what we do to life-saving care but but you know your productivity drops at, at a certain point and you're just making mistakes and and doing all this uh, tons of problems with it and so um being drawn up now by kind of the incoming composers but um i think it's impossible to be a film composer if you don't experience the emotions you're trying to be scoring mm -hmm. right so like get out there get your the heart broken like 
spend time with your friends, do, do all the things where you're like, you're scoring a scene and you, you see that like, I, I don't think you're able to fully grasp a scene and score it correctly. If you haven't experienced all those things, you know, um, just to some extent. Um, but, um, yeah, so just type of person and, and it just depends on, on what is important to you. But for me, I'm the type of person that would rather say I have a bunch of cues to write and it's 5 p.m. and I have to deliver at 8 a.m. And I have plans with a friend. Like, I rarely cancel. I would rather go out and have that beer with a friend and come back and stay up till 4 a.m. to finish then work straight through that, blow off the friend and work till 11 or, or midnight. So that's just a conscious choice I make to, to keep that in balance. And um, I try to wake up, you know, seven or eight every day. I walk my one-eyed three-legged dog around the block. He can't go that far. So it's just a short, short little walk. And we get back and I make a cup of coffee. I meditate every day, um, which I've found I'm sure some of you do, but life-changing for me. I just use the Headspace app and I go through those different courses, whatever is speaking to me in the moment, and then um, have four more coffees, think about writing, have another coffee, think about how I should start writing, <laughs> and then and then eventually get into it. And, you know, some days the the muse just isn't there. And sometimes you're like, okay, well, I have this... 84 minutes of music. I have to do five, six, seven minutes of music a day, sometimes 10 minutes of music a day. And, you know, sometimes you have to be like, well, it's just not happening today. I can either slog through this queue or I can add one more minute tomorrow, hoping I'll be in a better headspace. And that's, that's a gamble. Cause you don't know if you will be. Um, and, uh, and it's just all kind of, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a hard question to answer. Cause it is, it is very different every day, but I do have systems for, for projects. I have spreadsheets I've built breaking down all my time and how much I, I know I have to do every day. Um, I talk with my agent once a week on the phone and um, kind of know what's coming down the pipeline. I have a big whiteboard that I just cleared off that I'm going to refill out today, which is like all the cues I have to write today, all the cues I have to write this week. What projects do I have to pay attention to? What are the calls with direct oh i have a call with the direct i mean you should see my uh, calendar i i kind of like i used to schedule like every hour and it got to be a little overwhelming because if you do one thing differently kind of throws off the whole day and i look at it and i'm like oh you're a failure <laughs> you know so you kind of uh so then i just started filling out like base like okay from i i play a lot of tennis and this is just me like i know not everybody likes sports or, or plays sports but for me i it was like, okay, what do like the top pro tennis players, how much do they train a day? Okay. They train for like six to eight hours a day. I'm like, okay, it doesn't matter when I do it. I just have to write for six hours a day. Usually it ends up being like 10, <laughs> but you know, you just have to get the flow. It's like writing the first paragraph and, and getting going. And it's, it's always daunting. And then you, you get in the flow and you get it done. Um, and then something that's been super important for me is making sure I eat <laughs> correctly. Um, when I moved to LA, I gained like 55 pounds when I assisted because I was like just grabbing sodas out of the fridge and, and I'm like, oh, why is this so hard? <laughs> and it's like, because I wasn't taking care of myself. And, um, and I, was, I was talking with my friend Peter the other day, um, Peter Schlosser. He was Steve Jablonski's assistant for like 15 years and he was like fit is a fiddle and i'm not talking about like body image like be who you are be comfortable i'm just talking from a health perspective um that i i just think it's important to to, to feel good because everything else is gonna gonna suffer but my friend peter um he had uh you know, gained a lot of weight for steve and stuff and uh -oh. he was joking he's like oh composers used to talk about which chair to use for their for their back and and he's like really he's like you just need to like work out your core uh anyway that to be said yeah i think there's just you have to take care of your community and your friends and family and 
colleagues. You have to take care of your work and not miss deadlines and, um, and take care of yourself. And I think uh, not to be all guru y, but I think it was in some book I, I read back in the day, but there's the, the different levels of discipline. There's, I think the, there's four. So there's one that's called the questioner. And that's somebody who just questions everything and is like, why is this this way? Why is that that way? And can be useful. Like if you're a philosopher, not as useful if you're a composer. The rebel is like, I don't care about anything. I'm just going to do my own thing. Maybe a little bit helpful creatively, not as useful in a collaborative situation. Then there is the obliger, which I was for a long time, which is you uphold promises to other people. You never miss a deadline. You always make sure you uphold promises to your friends, but it's kind of at the expense of yourself and you never really take care of yourself, but you're hitting your deadlines, all that. And then the, the Mecca is you become the, it's called the upholder, which is you always are taking, so you're upholding promises to yourself and those around you basically. So I've kind of moved through all those things and I, I think it's an, important to, um, yeah not just make sure everyone else is okay at the expense of yourself. You've got to look out for number one sometimes. So anyway, tangents. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I just want to do a quick check. Would there, would there be anyone that wants to ask a question down the line? One, two, three, three. Okay. Okay. Nice. I'll ask you one more question and then we'll get to that then. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, being reactive, like, Go out there, experience all these things, so that when you're seeing a scene, you can make that you can have that visceral reaction, and it'll you know, which is the most important thing. You could be the best writer in the world, but if you're not hitting the right moods, I mean, you're not doing it right. So, um, when you when you're working on a scene. like this is what I need to change this is what I need to change is there something yeah. like that <laughs> it is funny because when, when I say this I, I think that's the first lifetime thriller I did like TV feature it was called sleepwalking in suburbia it was about this woman who was going around killing people just like she was sleepwalking and, and she was cheating on her husband going across the street and she's like I don't remember he's like I saw you she's like, I don't remember and um so I remember my friend being like, you know how you always say, like, you have to go out and experience life and do this thing. He's like, you have a lot of experience sleepwalking across the street and killing people. And I was like, I do not. Um, but, um, you know, it is funny to get caught up in like how ridiculous a scene is sometimes or like just out there and abstract. And you're like, I don't know what emotion this is. And I think like actually meditation really, really helped with that because it let me tap into like kind of my just direct feelings and not being so cerebral about it. Just really what, like when I, when I get into trouble, sometimes I just delete the cue um, because like my ninja skills, I'm a pretty fast writer. So that's a luxury, but I'm like, okay, like if this is not working, it's probably because I'm writing the wrong kind of music. Um, so then I'll just mute my music, maybe not delete the cue. I'll watch the scene again and just like, maybe I'll go for a break, walk around the block, I'll come back and I'll it with fresh eyes and ears and just be like, how, what is my initial reaction to this? Is it fear? Is it funny? And then like, maybe if it's funny, the way to make it funny is playing the fear against it and scoring it on the nose. And then, so there, there's multiple layers to it, but I think like always just coming back, listening with fresh ears, I, my biggest problem I run into when I write is I overwrite. So a lot of times my process is, muting 15 things and being like oh that like cool synth pad i made on the ms20 is like all this cue needs it didn't need the strings and you know this other pulse and and all that kind of stuff so yeah when i get into trouble i just truly like try to purge it from my mind take a quick break reassess and really go with that gut initial feeling and just kind of start over or if my initial feeling is somewhere there in the queue that I have, yeah, start muting stuff, start rearranging. Um, I always, when I start a queue, <coughs> I always map it out completely first. So, you know, I'll go through, figure out tempos, drop my markers, 
figure out what I want to hit loosely before the cut, after the cut. Um, so I'll have my pacing mapped out, which is super helpful because then I, what, even if I delete a cue, I know where I have to hit and I know like that that's the hardest part for me. So I'll go through a reel at a time on a lifetime film and I'm like, okay, I'm going to do, I'm going to go map out every cue. I haven't even started writing. So, um, it's kind of just how I do it anyway. Yeah. So I think what you're saying is like, you try to get the arc, you try to, you try to make a mold of the arc first before moving on to like the, the craft work, which can be, you know, the notes or, you know, the, the instrumentation or stuff like that. It's, it's yeah, easy to get it's just, caught up yeah, in break, that. Yeah, breaking it up into, into pieces because I think it's easy to be like, oh my God, I have 84 messages. It's right. How the hell am I going to do this? And breaking it up into that, that bite sized thing when you're like, okay, well, it's mapped out now. Now all I have to do is write the music. I don't have to think about the math or, um, you know, I can just be emotional with it and, and actually do right. what we're supposed to be doing. So, yeah. Right. All right. I think we can move on to some questions now. Um, would you like to ask Andy your question? Hello. Hey. I had a question about some of your compositions in terms of documentaries. And mm -hmm. if you found that in comparison to movies and TVs, you may have had like more freedom or how you go about creating the mood. Is it different than the process that you would do to movies? Cause there's maybe not the same type of storyline and stuff like that. Yeah. Great question. Um, the one main thing about documentaries is there's tons of dialogue. Um, so you have to be always, always weary of that. And David Attenborough doing, doing his thing. I wish it was David Attenborough, wow. but like for all the Nat Geo stuff, um, it's very, I love doing the nature documentaries because they're really, for me, there's been a lot of freedom and a lot of room to breathe. Actually, it's, it's up here right now. I'm doing this show called, um, it's a whole series on Nat Geo and Disney plus, but this is United Arab Emirates from above. They do like India from above and China from above and all that stuff. But like this scene, if there's like no dialogue, it's just this beautiful. Um, and this is about feeding camels. So that should be like, again, I've never fed camels. What emotion is that? Who knows? We're going to find out. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I feel like uh, in the documentary space, one thing with documentaries that's really interesting is that, that people work, it's almost more like games because these people work on these shows and documentaries for years. So by the time you get it, I, I find documentary filmmakers to be more particular, um, but um, in a good way, I think notes make things better. You know, sometimes you just get ridiculous things and you have to do it because it's your job. Um, but, but for the, the most part, like documentary filmmakers have like a really good language for, for what they want. Um, I've also found in documentaries that I, I music edit a lot more. So if I'm doing like a really long, uh, and, and I think people sometimes get really weary, especially starting out of, of music editing, um, even your own cues, like tracking your own cues into different parts, but it actually, you know, sometimes you find really interesting places to put cues, changing tempos, and it, it keeps the score really consistent across the mix. Um, but to the heart of your question, um, I, yeah, I, I love docs. I could do docs the rest of my life. And I think it's a really interesting space right now. I think there's, I just did, I just worked with my friend Genevieve Vincent, who's a Berkeley alum a few years before me, helped her out on the um, new Brittany Murphy doc on HBO. And we, we had all these conversations um, just about a little electronic score, more like her band. And they just kind of let her go with it. And um, I, I find that in TV, like a lot of the, these things are like an episode a week and in TV, there's just less time to, excuse my language, like fuck around, <laughs> you know, there's just <sighs> le less time. So they kind of, they, there's a lot of trust in TV um, of just like that you're going to get it done and it's going to be cool and it's going to make people feel things. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but, but I have found luckily in the work I've done in the documentary space, because it's been a lot of like sweeping vistas and like last Alaskans, especially it was just like these beautiful drone shots of Alaska for like two minutes with no dialogue. And they're like, go for it. And I'm like, this is the goddamn dream. Like, this is amazing. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's, it's different every time, but, but uh, yeah, definitely 
put my documentary hat on when, when I'm doing it because it is different. And like, yeah, dialogue is king and and that and then just like really knowing when to open it up and a lot of times too like it's you want to write with dialogue in mind and and navigate that but the dub mixer is going to do a lot of that too so like you know sometimes just write a good piece of music if it's not fitting perfectly under dialogue like if you have a week to score it you know sometimes you have to just get through it and like so always do your best but yeah anyway so thank you so much it was very helpful cool all right, second question. Sure. Hello. Hey. Hi, I'm Wyatt. Um, thank you for doing nice this, by you. the way. This is awesome. Yeah, of course. Nice um, to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you, too. Uh, I was just going to ask about finding, uh, like, an agent versus a team, and, like, when did you do that? At what point? And, like, how helpful was that in, like, your processes? Yeah, great question. Um, I think a lot of people think about this, especially when they're coming out, because, you know, they think the agent's going to be the key to getting the bigger jobs and stuff. And um, first of all, really focus on your relationships with other composers. I cannot stress that enough when you move here. It is important to develop relationships with filmmakers and, and do that, but especially like financially in the beginning and paying your bills and like that can guide you. Um, and actually know what you're going through and struggling with, like make those relationships. Um, so I'd say that's first. And then, yeah, start thinking about your team team early. And, you know, your orchestrator could be sitting in this room with you. Um, I mean, like I said, that friend that came out and took over my job at Ryan Shores, he's my music editor. He's an amazing composer. He does a ton of things, but he's my music editor um, on all these lifetime projects. And then my friend from Berkeley that lived down the hall Alvin Wee he just mixed my last film and he just was the co like one of the mixers on Bond and like he just like it's you just never know um, um, what your team's gonna be but then be loyal to that you know sometimes people can't do a job or whatever but I think really having some foresight and not always being like oh I want to work with the big orchestrator and the big contractor and like I think it's important to, to realize that all those people that came up together that, that work really closely now that are the big folks, um, you know, really believed in each other and helped each other and did the damn thing. And, um, and everyone's kind of just like in it, in it to do it together. But I think like key team members are having someone eventually, you know, when you're starting out, you're going to have to do it all yourself just because you're not going to, unless a friend wants to help for free, but you don't always want to ask yeah. for that. Um, and it gets harder and harder as everyone starts doing bigger and better things. Um, but I think like a music editor, it's great to have around orchestrator, copyist, some like that's been the most helpful thing for me on a lot of this stuff is just like, I have someone that can just do quick parts for me. And that's not my orchestrator for other things. That's like, you know, maybe someone a bit younger that is like doing copy work for a composer that I'm like, okay, you know, come into my fold. But basically I've just been developing this team of, I have four contractors I can call I have musicians I love working with um you know I have my core like quartet I work with a lot and then for bigger and he's one of the main studio musicians out here um and he'll, he'll do that so yeah I think contractor players music editor orchestrator slash copyist and then um and then I would say probably in the last like three years I've had some part-time assistants um I'm like again like pretty quick so it's always just been not even a financial thing now it's just been like okay like bringing someone into your space is like pretty sacred you know and and it's it's hard because I think Ryan always told me he's like you want to find people that can do it at like 80 percent of the level you can like more of the assistant work kind of stuff and um I'm very particular. So it's been like, it's been hard to like, you know, and also like sometimes people then go find like assistants, like the, then Hans wants to hire them. And I'm like, yeah, go do it. Um, but then the agent thing, um, I would say that don't be too focused on it. I think advice I got, which I was rolled my eyes at, but here I am now giving it is that, you know, agents kind of come to you when, when you're ready for it and um so my newest agent arbel badak um again was a friend i got coffee with 
um, I knew him through industry events and he was actually at um, Capitol for a long time in Decca Records, like Oliver Arnold's label and, and all them. And then yeah. he decided to start his own agency and I was potentially going to sign with a bigger agency. And Arbel was like, look, like that's going to be a hundred people on that roster. Like um, I'm super hungry. Like I know all these studio execs, like, and he's just been amazing. And um, so I think, yeah, letting someone come to you, but being aware of it. And like, if people want to meet with you or like reaching out to agents is fine. Getting on people's radar, being at events, introducing yourself to those people is great. So when the time comes, you know, it's not out of left field and you can kind of make it. But at the end of the day, you know, you still have to put in a lot of the groundwork yourself. An agent is nice to offload contracts to and do all that stuff. And Arbel represents me on the sync side too. So with my songwriting partner, Hillary Reynolds, um, another Berkeley person who I didn't know at Berkeley, just, just met out here. Uh, we do a lot of like sync stuff for commercials and song placements for film and TV. And he represents me on that side and then the film scoring side. And uh, I, you know, I would say 90% of my work I've, I've brought in to, to the situation um, okay. for now that, that will change um, because he's getting me in rooms that like I couldn't have done by myself, you know? Um, and sometimes the, honestly, just having an agent gets you into that next room um because they're like oh well you're legit now which is ridiculous but but it's kind of a thing sometimes yeah. so uh, definitely yeah thank you thank you so much you got it you got it you have one more question is it i thought i saw one more okay all right andy last question coming up well i've got a little bit of time by the way if you I, i'm sure you guys have class and stuff but yeah whatever you need yeah i was just wondering uh more about like um, TV, what is kind of like the schedule now nowadays with with composing for for TV rather than film? Yeah, uh, so depends on the show, but it's usually a week to ten days. So I will spot on a Friday. Um, you, so just the standard, I'll spot on a Friday, um, kind of get stuff together, start writing over the weekend. So through like Tuesday or Wednesday need to do any recording um and wednesday thursday mixing the last half thursday deliver that episode friday um so and round and round it goes depending depending on the season some of these nat geo shows we just have you know 20 when you're like okay well this block of time now i know that like and then they'll be like okay halfway through the season we have a two-week hiatus or or whatever and and we take a little bit of a break um but yeah i would say 10 10 days is like the average cycle for for for, for one episode yeah thank you very much <laughs> yeah you got it thank you <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, all right so i wish we could talk more I understand you have more time, but we're we're closing in now. No, so, yeah, you gotta go. Cool. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. Um, yeah, yep. good luck, and uh, I congratulations to you guys like going through all the COVID stuff. I feel for you with ridiculous. So heart goes out to you all, and um, uh, yeah hope hope everything gets a little better and the winter isn't too bad there this year and uh but hang in there and um if you ever want to reach out you can grab my email from christian or just reach out through my website my email's on there um happy to answer any questions you know the the more people that you can just have to talk to when you're feeling bad about everything and just um and i think christian too like i i think christian also asked me to just come in because i you know i'm not Hans, obviously, and I'm like kind of in that middle soup now, and I think it's important to talk to people um, that are like, you know, working composers, but not like scoring James Bond, and because that's like your next step. And um, so, anytime you have questions or feel like you want to quit or whatever, just reach out and I'll snap you out of it. So, hey, Andy, um, you are now the guy on the other side of the screen, so don't be too humble. <laughs> <laughs> hey thanks thanks um but um hope you all have a great rest of your week and uh good luck talk to you soon all right take Thank care you. Thank you.